Hello everyone, welcome to an OET reading practice. This time we're going to do a guided practice for one reading text C. In this video we're going to do a quick recap of reading part C. If you already know it, just skip on to the actual reading text itself and the questions. I've timestamped it so you'll be able to do that. We're going to be doing four questions as guided practice. So that's when I'm going to talk you through how I would answer these questions. You'll then get a chance to practice four questions by yourself and these will be timed. And then of course we'll take a look at the answers and why they are in fact the answers. Welcome back for those of you who are joining me again and hello for those of you who are joining for the first time. It's great to see you all here. My name's Sona and I'm your online OET tutor with Bose Learning. I'm a premium preparation provider of the OET. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of the OET reading part C then. So in part C, you're going to be given two longer texts, and these are the kinds of texts you would read for professional development. So they're general medical interest texts. Today, we're just going to look at one of them. Each text has eight questions, so you're going to get 16 questions in total. And each question has four multiple choice options so they give you the options, you choose the best one. You're going to be given part B and part C together in the OET reading. And for both parts, you're going to get 45 minutes in total. So for part C, you need to be spending around about 32 minutes. Um, quite precise in the number of minutes. That's because of course, if you have 32 minutes, 16 questions, you're going to get two minutes per question, of course. Okay, what about my strategy then? This is what I do. I take a look at the title because this of course is going to give me a clue as to what the text is about. It's going to get that metacognitive ability working. Your brain's going to be picking out all the useful bits of knowledge it has about the text. Um, topics, so including vocabulary, things you've read before. Of course you don't need all of this but it helps get your brain warmed up and your brain is going to have some kind of clue about what the text is about. Then I'm going to tackle each question one at a time. I read the first question, I look only at the question and then I look at the paragraph and I try and answer that question in my own words using the paragraph that I've just read and then and only then do I look at the options and see which option best fits my idea. So read the question, read the paragraph and answer in your own words and then pick out the best option. That's what I would do. So here we go with some guided practice. Now this text is from the BMJ. I'll put the URL below. Um, it's also in the comments box so you can take a look at it and have a read of it yourself. Um, it's a little bit shorter than OET texts which tend to be about 800 words and this is just under that. Um, but it's still be it will still be a useful practice exercise for you. And this text is by an author called David Oliver. And the question is, what can we learn from formal complaints during COVID-19? So what lessons can we take away from what's been going on? So it's all about complaints and what we can do about them. So question number seven, that's the first one in part C, um, because one to six is covered by a reading part B. So your first question in reading part C will be number seven. And it says this, in the first paragraph, what does the author imply about the way complaints were handled during the pandemic? So straight away, we've got the topic of complaints and how they were handled. And we've got this implication. So I know that things are not necessarily going to be written in black and white for me. So then I read through the text fairly quickly, but I am going to read it, but I'm going to focus in on complaints. So I have a look through, it's all about unprecedented challenges. There's a lot of demand, of course, for healthcare services during a pandemic. COVID cases are rising again. Customers are angry or unhappy. So we're coming up to complaints. 
But as we recover from the pandemic, our handling of complaints must surely change. So this is the bit I'm focusing on. Our handling, the way we manage complaints, must surely change. So why would you want something to change? You'd only want it to change if the process of handling complaints is not working. So if something is not working, we want it to change. So the implication here is that complaints are not or were not being handled properly during the pandemic. So let me look at my options. So what does the author imply about complaints? They were harder to manage because more members of the general population complained. Um, I don't remember reading anything about there being more complaints during the pandemic. They just were complaints. They were well handled until the numbers of COVID started to rise again. Well, again, why would we change it if it was well handled? There's nothing about the process changing just because the number of cases are rising again. They were adequately managed. Well, that means, okay, they were dealt with fairly okay by the healthcare staff. No, they were inadequately managed. Yes. So we would want the system to change if things were not working properly, if complaints were being inadequately managed by healthcare services. So the option here that I would choose, and that's correct, is D. Number eight then, what do we learn in the second paragraph, so we've moved on, about the way inspections were carried out between March 2020 and May 2022? So keywords here, are inspections, and we're learning something. How were they carried out? So I read carefully. I can see coming up, I've got an underlined phrase. That means probably the next question is going to be related to that. But in the meantime, let me just focus on this. What do we learn about the way inspections were carried out? In March 2020, NHS England and NHS Improvement ordered a suspension of all routine inspections from England's Health and Social Care Regulator, and this is the name of the regulator. And by 2022, the regulator told us that inspections now continued in a limited, flexible and risk-based way. So during this time, there was a suspension and now it started again in a limited way. So inspections were stopped during that time. That's what I understand. Let me look at my options then. They were temporarily abandoned, yes, but I'm just going to check the other ones. They were organised by the NHS England and NHS Improvement. Well, inspections aren't organised by them. They're regulated by the CQC, so that's wrong. The numbers increased. No, nothing about the numbers of inspections increasing. And they were carried out as per normal. No, they were suspended. They were temporarily abandoned. So it's option A. Right, -o, moving on to number nine. In the second paragraph, what idea is emphasised by the phrase, it remains to be seen how this ambition plays out. So this is why they've underlined this. So I go back to here. By May 2022, the CQC told us that inspections now continued in a limited, flexible and risk-based way focusing on instances of concern over risk to patient safety and supporting system-wide recovery. Okay, so that's what they want to do. That's their ambition. It remains to be seen how this ambition plays out. So I can't really predict this too much if I don't know the meaning of played out. That's why I'm reading the text. It remains to be played out. It remains to be seen. So we don't know yet is my idea. That's how I would read it. And the one for we don't know yet is option C. There's nothing about it being childish. They're talking about playing, but not in a childish way. It is a laudable ambition to have. You might not know the meaning of the word laudable, but you can probably maybe try and guess it's something either positive or negative. But... It's not really about what kind of ambition it is. Actually, it means it's a really positive ambition to have. 
But that's not what they're saying. We have to wait and see if this ambition can be fulfilled. That's what this means. It remains to be seen. We have to wait and see. And the ambition remains strong, remains, remains. Okay, but that's not what it means. It means we have to wait. Are they going to achieve their ambition of achieving system-wide recovery? Well, we have to see. And number 10, what do we learn about the fears of clinical staff who work under COVID-related pressures? So this time we're focusing on fears of staff. We can possibly imagine, I'm sure you can imagine, the kinds of fears you would have. So let's have a read of what the paragraph tells us. Also, back in 2020, da, 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 so I'm kind of reading, caring for patients, challenging, designed to reassure staff. So this is not you, someone is frightened, has a fear, then you reassure them. What staff want to hear in direct terms is, if you find yourself working in unfamiliar roles and environments, under extraordinary pressure, and doing things for which you feel semi-prepared and partially supported will take no action against you unless you've been, you're engaged in willful criminal activities. Otherwise, staff will feel less protected. Here we go. Fears by our regulators and just expect trouble once the pandemic is over. So they are worried about being less protected even after the pandemic is over. They need this reassurance and they need it directly to say, that you will be supported if what you're doing is not criminal but is just um you know you're just working under this terrible extraordinary pressure so they are worried they won't be supported if things go wrong yeah they're worried criminals will attack them well no unless they are criminals they will they are bound to be supported they are worried they will catch COVID. Well, that's a legitimate concern, but it's not expressed here. And their fears are not based on fact. No, nothing about that. So my option for this is A. And I've eliminated the other ones. So that sounds the most logical and is in fact the correct answer. Okay, so that's enough of me guiding you through it. Have a go yourself now. You're going to get four more to do by yourself. I'm going to give you two minutes for each one and then we'll go through the answers. Here we go. It's the same text, by the way. Here we go.
So number 11, this maelstrom then, was this idea that the healthcare system was in chaos. People had to resort to doing these unconventional things. So there's nothing about there being many options. These were these non-conventional options. The weather, yes, it's a storm, but actually it's this idea of chaos rather than a physical storm. And nothing about the number of complaints increasing or reducing. It's just this idea of chaos. Things weren't as they normally were. So it's A. Number 12, they worked well beyond the call of duty. They worked harder than the work outlined in their job descriptions. I'm sure you can all relate to that. I'm sure you all do much more work than actually you're meant to. That just seems to go hand in hand on healthcare and professionals. And number 13, many complaints will be directly or indirectly related to COVID pressures. So these are outside of the control of the staff. It's nothing to do with them. They are not really their problem, but they have to deal with them. So it's option B. And then number 14. Here at the beginning, this consultation does not, to my mind, to the author's mind, sufficiently reflect the constraints of practice. It did not fully represent the situation that clinical staff find themselves working in. So it's option D. Well, I hope you found that useful. Thanks very much for watching. If you've got a question, pop it in the question box, the comments box below, and I'll answer it if I can. Why not just say hi if you want to? Um, tell me where you're from. It's always great to hear from my students. If you're interested in one of my on-demand courses on Udemy, then take a look again at the info box below. I'll put in some discount codes for you. And once again, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe hit that like button, send this video to friends or colleagues and why not watch one more video right now. I've put up some links of things that you might find interesting. All right, hope to see you next time. Take care. Bye bye.